So this is obviously Easter Resurrection Sunday. Some of you may be here, uh, and I don't know, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands, but some of you might be the, the kind of people that you go to church once a year, or maybe twice a year, and, uh, and, and this is it, and man, this is a great day to be here, and, um, and, and if, if you're the kind of person that comes once a year, you may have a question, like, how come whenever I go, they always talk about the same exact thing, and it's because, well, it's Easter, and that's what we talk about on Easter, but if you come other times of the year, you're invited to come to their, that too, and we talk about other things, which is, uh, which is great and exciting. So, uh, so make sure you come back next week. Um, but again, I don't, know, I don't know what brought you here. Some of you maybe come regularly. Some of you maybe haven't been in a while. Some of you maybe uh, you, were, you were, you know, drugged and thrown in a car and said you're going to church this morning or, or, or a cute girl invited you and you're like, man, I'll go wherever you're going. It doesn't matter to me. Or maybe somebody says, I'll buy you lunch if you come. It, Whatever your reason is, we're glad that you're here, and we're glad to have you. And, and you know, some people, you know, come to church, and, and, and we kind of, uh, you know, we talk about God, we talk about Jesus, and, and for some people, and maybe this is you, I don't know, but you come with this idea that, you know, it's a lot of, a lot of empty promises. You know, a lot of empty promises with God and Easter and church in the Bible. Maybe you've grown up, you know, in, in a certain church or in a certain belief system and you found that, that it was a lot of empty promises. Has anyone ever made you an empty promise before? Anyone, anyone ever? Like a couple of you guys. Some of you just aren't brave enough. That's okay. I wouldn't raise my hand either. Um, but we have these empty promises. What's an empty promise? It's a promise of something that never ends up happening. When my wife and I got married, uh, I was really into uh, video cameras <laughs> for some reason. And I wanted to buy a video camera. And I found this camera that I liked. And I was like, I'm going to buy the video camera. And keep in mind, we're just newlyweds. We've only been married a little bit of time. We got, like, no money. And, uh, and I find this video camera I decided to buy. And it was $4,000. And um, so I'm like, I'm going to buy this video camera. And, and somehow I convinced her to go along with this, uh, this scheme. And, and so the guy, uh, he, he was located in England. And he's like, I will do it. You wire me $2,000. I'll send you the camera. When you get the camera and you inspect it, check it all out. Then you can wire me the other $2,000. like, sounds fair enough. So I wired him the $2,000. He sent me the tracking number. And I waited for the camera to arrive. And I waited for the camera to arrive. <laughs> And I waited for the camera to arrive. And here I am, like 16 years later, and I'm still waiting for the camera to arrive. $2,000, like, it was just gone. I'm like, man, like, it didn't even dawn on me that, like, oh, maybe he's just going after that half amount there. And um, so that was an empty promise. He promised me a camera, and I never got it. And, uh, and, and, and when we have these empty promises, it's, uh, it's disappointing. Like, anybody get an Easter basket today, you know? Or maybe you made an Easter basket. Imagine... Getting an Easter basket or going on an Easter egg hunt, you're like, whoa, this is great, I got an egg, you know, and, and the girl's like, maybe there's a diamond ring in there or something, and, and you open it up and, what? What? <laughs> Wait a minute, this is no fun. It's like, oh, I thought you just liked to look for eggs. No, you actually want something in those eggs. It's an empty promise, man. We don't like empty promises. We're in the season of empty promises, though, aren't we? We're getting ready to get a new president. <laughs> Man. <laughs> There's empty promises all over the place. I mean, they're just, they're just handing them out like they're going out of style. It's like, here, you want, I'll be my firstborn child after you if you vote for me. And, you know, and, and we'll find out like a month or two months, maybe a year in, we're like, oh, what about that? thing about you naming your firstborn child after me, you know, oh, we find out that these things are empty promises. I wonder if you've ever made an empty promise to somebody, say, oh, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you this, or I'm going to do that, I'm going to pick you up for this, and, and then we don't do it. Or, you know, we, it's even worse than this, and maybe you've never done this, made an empty promise to God. Okay, and you're like, oh, wow, oh, just, just hear me out for a minute. God if you help me pass my test, I'm going to go to church. Or, or if you help me pass this exam, if you help me get this job, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go and help poor people. I'm going to go serve in a soup kitchen. And then you pass that test and you're like, oh God, never mind. I didn't need your help after all. Um, I'm not going to do my 
deal. It's an empty promise that we give to God. Proverbs talks about this kind of person. In Proverbs 25, 14, it says, A person who promises a gift but doesn't give it is like a cloud and winds that bring no rain. A person who promises a gift and doesn't give it. Well, if you're taking notes, write this down. When Jesus died, it looked like everything he said was an empty promise. It looked like every single thing he had said up until that point was an empty promise. I mean, he said he was the Messiah. He said he was the Son of God. He said that he was going to build a kingdom here, and now he's dead. It's all just a bunch of empty promises. Did you know there was no followers at the crucifixion? There was no believers at the crucifixion. They weren't sitting around singing kumbaya and oh, on a hill far away is the old rugged cross. They weren't singing that then. Man, there was no followers. They all abandoned Jesus. In fact, the very guys that wrote the account that we have in the Bible, they wrote themselves in as cowards saying, we ran. We were scared. We were terrified. Jesus got arrested and we were out of there. We denied him. We, didn't, we said we didn't even know him. They all ran because they felt at this point it's all a bunch of empty promises. Everything that Jesus said is all a bunch of empty promises. People even began to make fun of him. And I mean, imagine what kind of person do you have to be to walk by a man hanging on a cross, dying, and you decide, I think I'm going to make fun of you. <laughs> like, uh, like how, I mean, I don't know about you, but and maybe it's just because I have kids. But if I was in that time period and I saw someone hanging up on a cross, dying, I'd probably take the long way home. <laughs> like, let's just scoot around this area and get home another way. But no, people decided now would be a good time to make fun of him. Listen to what it says in Matthew 27. Starting in verse 39. It says, the people passing by, they're passing by, and they started shouting abuse, shaking their heads in mockery, saying, look at you now, look at you now, hanging there on that cross. They yelled at him, you said you were going to destroy the temple and rebuild it in three days? Well, well, if you're the son of God, save yourself and get down off that cross. Come on, get down off that cross. Then the leading priests, these are the religious people, these are the church people, these are the people that think they know it all about God. The leading priests, the teachers of religious law, and the elders also mocked him, saying, he saved others, they scoffed, but he can't save himself. So, so he's the king of, the is uh, king of Israel, is he? Well, let him come down from the cross now, and then we'll believe in him. He trusted God so much, so let God rescue him if he wants. Because he said, he said, I am the son of God, so let God rescue him. Come on down, Jesus. Give us a little show. It says, verse 44, even the revolutionaries who were crucified with him ridiculed him in the same way. They're nailed up too. And they're like, yeah, man, get us down. Let's get off. You think you're so great? Get us all off the crosses. We'll go have a party. No one believed at that moment that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. No one believed it. They thought it was all just a bunch of empty promises. They thought it was all just empty. Here's the thing about God's promises, though. God's promises are different than our promises. And your notice it says, instead of promises that are empty... God gave us something empty that is full of promise. Instead of just giving us an empty promise, God gave us something that was empty that is full of promise. And the first thing that he gave us is the empty cross. The guy in our church, Joe, made this for us this week. Great cross. But guess what? Now, sometimes you see crosses, and they got Jesus on it. But, but, but the cross that, that we recognize is an empty cross. He's not on it anymore. And so this empty cross. Now, think about for a moment. 
Different religious symbols, different symbols of the world religions. We got a couple of them, okay? Let's pop one of those up here. This is the Hindu religious symbol. It's called Om. Om. You may hear people doing that. What, what this means is, is the vibration of the supreme. I don't know what that means exactly, but that's what Om means. That's what the symbol represents. Let's look at another one. You guys know what this one is? Islam, right? Islam's in the news now. They, they have the star and the crescent moon. You know what the star and the crescent moon means? Well, it was a symbol of the Ottoman Empire. It was the largest Muslim empire at the time, so they adopted it as a symbol for their religion. The next one, you know what this one is? The star of David, the hexagram, the six-pointed star. It's the star of David. Um, and, and that's uh, the symbol of, of, of Judaism, the Jews. This is, this is their symbol. And then ours... What do we have? Did you know, out of every world religion that there is, every single one of them, not one of them, has a symbol of torture and death, except us. Imagine that. Not, none of them. I mean, I mean, and especially, not even just a symbol of torture and death, a symbol of torture and death that killed their founder. Now, now Mormonism was founded by Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith went out in a blaze of glory. I mean, he was shooting guns, they were shooting guns, he got pumped full of lead and fell out a window and died. Now imagine if Mormons gathered around and said, you know what, we need a symbol. Let's take a bullet, and that'll be the symbol for Mormonism. Like, everybody would be like, you know what, Charlie, that's a bad idea. Let's find something better. You know, they, but, but here, Christianity... We say, let's take this, and this is going to be the symbol that represents us. Imagine one of your loved ones went out, and, and they're out, and they just happen to be taking a nap on a train track. And a train barrels by, and your loved one is lost to a train. And you say, wow, this is horrible. My loved one died because of a train track. I'm going to start collecting trains now, you know? I'm going to go buy as many trains. I'm going to hang trains on my wall. I'm going to get a necklace with trains. I'm going to, I'm going to get, 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 a, get a shirt that says, this train's for you. And, and, you know, this is going to be great. No, no, no. You say, you're crazy. Like, well, what are you doing remembering that person by the implement that killed them? So let's talk about the crucifixion for a moment. Well, before Jesus was even crucified... Scripture tells us that he was beaten. And this was customary. This is what they would do, what the Romans would do. They would beat you first. They would beat him with rods. You know, they, they beat him with rods. They also, they also whipped him with the, with the cat of nine tails. Many of us are familiar with the cat of nine tails. It was a whip that they would dip in, uh, in lamb's blood, and then they would dip that in shards of pottery and sand and stone, stuff like that. So, when they, so when, they would, when they would whip the person, it would take off chunks in the process. So, so they would whip him, they whipped him, they beat him, they, they laughed at him, they said, oh, you say you're the king of the Jews. Well, any good king needs a crown. So they made him a crown out of thorns. They got the biggest thorns they could find, they wrapped them all together, they took the thorns, they beat these thorns down onto his head. This is, and they haven't even got to the crucifixion yet. He's already losing large quantities of blood. And then they bring out the cross and say, say carry this cross. So he carries the cross as long as he can. He needs some help to carry it. They carry it to Golgotha. At that point, they lay him out on the cross. And, and, and there's some different ideas on exactly how it happened. But the best that I can see is they, they, they took spikes and they went through his wrist. Some people say his hands. Some people say his wrist. I, we don't know exactly. It doesn't really matter. I don't think we want a spike going through either part. Um, and so they drove these spikes through his, his wrists onto the cross beams of the cross. And then most likely what they did is they, they turned his feet sideways like this up against the cross. And they took a single spike and went through both ankles into the wood. Then at that point they lifted up and set it into place. And there he is to hang. Now, now death by crucifixion is uh, is not a pleasant experience. The, re the way you die in crucifixion is actually suffocation. See, because what you're doing is, is your hands are, are, are so far over your head and your chest cavity is, is you know, the weight is pulling you down and it's hard for you to get a breath of air. And the only way to get a deep breath is to put pressure on either the spike in your feet or the spikes in your hands. And, or maybe the combination of the two. And so you pull on those they might have a little bit of rope wrapped around to help. 
But you're pulling on this to lift yourself up, take a deep breath, and then lower yourself down to get a little bit of relief from the spikes. And now imagine this for hours and hours on end in the hot sun. So here's Jesus. He's hanging on the cross. And now, let me just say this. When Jesus was crucified, they didn't invent crucifixion that day. They weren't like, hey guys, we got a guy to kill. Let's figure out how to kill him. And the guy's like, hey, I got an idea. Let's take a cross and nail him to it. No. See, this was a common way of killing criminals, people that were speaking out against the Roman Empire. Any number of things could get you nailed to this cross. In fact, I think if we lived in that society, when we're walking to the market or walking to work or walking through town, probably on most days we could take a look over onto that hill and we would see someone there on a cross dying. D don't allow yourself to believe that, that when Jesus was, was, was crucified on a cross that they just went out, they freshly hewn a cross and they put him on it and then they went and they preserved the cross for you know, years to come after that. No, no, no. no. They, these were common tools. This cross that Jesus died on very likely was one that was used by hundreds of other people that have died on, and very likely hundreds more to follow died on this as well. The Romans were professionals. They did this every single day. They knew how to crucify people. They were professional crucifiers. They knew what to look for. And if you somehow lasted too long on that cross, and they were ready to go home for dinner, well then what they would do is they would come up and they would break your legs. Because when they break your legs, now you can't push on that spike anymore and now you suffocate in a few minutes and then you're dead. So near the end of the day after hours and hours up on these crosses the soldiers decided let's go ahead and let's end this. They went they started breaking the legs and they came to Jesus and they recognized that he was already dead. Some people say well maybe he just fell asleep. I don't know about you but I don't think I could sleep in that context okay. I'm hanging from a cross and I'm like you know what guys I'm just going to take a little snooze here and, and, and say, well, maybe he went unconscious. These Roman soldiers were not stupid. They did this every single day. They knew when you were dead, and they said, oh, he's dead. But just to make sure, I'm going to take my spear and shove it into his side, most likely penetrating his heart as well. He's dead. They are not letting a living person off the cross. In fact, in all of recorded history, there's only one instance where anyone ever survived crucifixion. And, and that was a time where Josephus had knew three men that were being crucified, and he went and he pleaded for them. And after they were already being crucified for many hours, the soldiers pulled these three men off of the cross, and two of them died, and one of them barely survived. So crucifixion was not something that you would survive. And Jesus didn't survive. There was no question that he was dead. No one was, was wondering. No one was saying, maybe he's still alive. Maybe he's just only mostly dead, you know. No, he was fully dead. So they pulled him off. So why did he die? Scripture tells us that the wages of sin is death. See, we've all sinned. We've all fallen short of God's standard. And we talked about this several weeks ago. Some people say, well, I just, I just made some mistakes in my life. Mistakes are things that we make on math tests, right? But when we deliberately do something that we know doesn't please God, and in many cases we do it over and over and over and over again, we can no longer call it a mistake. It becomes something more serious than that. It becomes sin. The penalty for that sin is death. And Jesus said, you know what? I'm going to pay the penalty for you. I'm going to be the one that goes and dies on the cross. I'm going to be the one that's killed for this sin. So this empty cross is a reminder that we've been forgiven. Empty cross reminds us that we've been forgiven. It reminds us that Jesus has paid the penalty for our sin. In Romans 6, verse 10 and uh, uh, 11, it says, When he died, he died once to break the power of sin. But now that he lives, he lives for the glory of God. So you should also consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin 
and alive to God through Christ Jesus. Because Jesus died on that cross, we should consider ourselves also dead to the power of sin. He died to defeat sin, and so we should be dead to that sin as well. When he died, he died once and for all. So the cross reminds us that we've been forgiven. The next thing, the next empty thing that God left for us as a promise was the empty tomb. The empty tomb. In John chapter 20, beginning in verse 1, we, we read the account of the very first Easter. It says, early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb. And she found the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. Now why was Mary there? Mary was there because Mary and actually two other women were there. And they were there to rewrap the body. The body had been wrapped uh, earlier, very hastily. And what, what did she know? The men wrapped the body. And if the men did it, what do you got to do, girls? You know, we got to go and do it over again, right? <laughs> so they're like, we got to go and fix what the guys did. We know they didn't take all the time. They weren't very careful with everything. And, you know, Peter's always in a hurry. So we're going to go and fix it. We're going to do it nice. So they go there. Now, it's interesting that they mention this. Because they, they would have taken this out of the Bible if they could. And here's the reason why. Women in that society, they were not even allowed to testify in court. Now, I, I, if that offends you, I'm sorry. I mean, that's not what I believe, but that's what that culture believed. They said, women are not trustworthy witnesses. So, so if John could have taken the credit for it or somehow said, oh, you know what, it was them, he would have gladly taken that out. Well, why did John say these women were the first people at the tomb? Because they were. They were the first people there. It actually discredits the account in many ways. But they, they didn't trust the word of a, of a woman. And here it says, She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciples whom Jesus loved. The, the one whom Jesus loved. This is John writing about himself here. And I always think that's kind of a funny way to do it. It's like, you know, Peter and the one he loved. <laughs> it's like, sorry, Peter. Jesus doesn't love you, buddy. <laughs> but it says, She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved. She says, they have taken the body out of the tomb. They have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. And we don't know where they have put him. What did she say? She's not saying, he's alive, he's alive. She's saying, they, somebody took the body and I don't know what they did with it. I mean, here's the thing. They weren't camping out in front of the tomb. They weren't, they weren't out there singing kumbaya and, you know, and doing a big count on five, four, three, two. And he's alive, yeah, Jesus. No, nobody was there. They didn't th they're like, you know what? We've seen dead people before. And when they're dead, they stay dead. So they're not camping out. What's her first reaction? Somebody took the body. And I don't know where they put him. So Peter and the other disciple, who's the other disciple? John, the guy writing this. Peter and the other disciple started out for the tomb. They were both running. But the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. I always thought that was funny that he put that in there, right? Like, here we are. We're talking about the resurrection of the God, and you're, like, talking smack. Just so you know, for all of, for all of eternity, for the next 2,000 years, I won the foot race. <laughs> I got there first. Peter's a slow folk, man. I was there first. So I don't know why you wrote that, but when he wrote it, he felt that was important to keep in there. John then stooped and he looked in and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Why didn't he go in? It's a tomb! Who wants to go in a tomb? I mean, maybe it's like, like somebody's going to jump out of boo, you know, or something. He doesn't want to go in. Simon Peter arrived, though, and he went right inside. He didn't care. And he also noticed the linen wrappings lying there. While the cloth that Jesus, covered Jesus' head was folded up, lying apart from the other wrappings. You know what people say? People say, somebody stole the body. Now, I don't know about you, but if I was going to steal the body, I wouldn't unwrap it first. <laughs> like, let's just make this really weird, guys. Let's unwrap the thing, and then we'll drag it out. And, and I don't know if you've ever gotten broken into and robbed before, but generally, generally, I don't know, maybe not, I don't know every criminal, but generally criminals aren't folding laundry, you know? They break in, oh, you know what? Here's some undies. I'm going to fold these up before I'm out of here. No, they're ransacking the place. If somebody stole it, First, they would have had to overpower the Roman guards that were there. They would have had to bro broken the seal of the tomb, move the stone, and then they're grabbing it and they're hauling out. But no, 
This tomb wrappings, the burial wrappings were laying there. Then to the disciple who did what? Who reached the tomb first. Again, got to just throw that in there, Peter. Sorry, man. Maybe you can keep up next time. The disciple who reached the tomb first also went in. And what does it say? He saw and did what? Believed. When did John become a believer in the Messiah? When did John believe that Jesus truly was the Son of God? It was when he saw the empty tomb. It's when he saw the empty tomb. He says he saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the dead. See, it wasn't the miracles. I mean, here's John. He followed Jesus around for probably nearly three years. And it wasn't the miracles that Jesus performed. It wasn't the teachings. It wasn't the Sermon on the Mount. It wasn't, it wasn't giving people bread. It wasn't healing people. It wasn't even him walking on water. It wasn't the great ideas that Jesus had that made him believe. In fact, when Jesus died, he didn't believe anymore. But when he saw the tomb was empty, he believed. Because the resurrection proved that Jesus' sacrifice worked. See, anyone could come out and make a bold claim. Say, when I die, all your sins are going to be forgiven. And you're like, okay, how are you going to prove that one, buddy? Well, just trust me, when I die, your sins are forgiven. Okay, well, we're all going to die. Last I checked... 100% of people die, so how, how are you going to prove that? And Jesus, when I die, your sins are going to be forgiven. And to prove that, I'm coming back to life again. It proved it. See, because if Jesus just stopped simply at dying on the cross, then the job wouldn't have been finished. See, the empty tomb, it gives us a hope and a promise of eternal life. Because see, if Jesus could come back to life like he said he would, then that validates everything else that he said. That validates the fact that he said he is the way, the truth, and the life. That validates the fact that he said he's going to go and prepare a place for us. That validates the fact that he says that we can have eternal life. Because he came back again and I say, you know what, if somebody can predict their own death and resurrection and then they actually pull it off, I just go with whatever that person says. Because he came back to life again. You know, all the world religions, they all have people that founded them, that were involved with the, with the, with the beginning of these religions. And those leaders at some point died. And they were usually buried. So let's see, we got one of these. This, this is Confucius's tomb. That's where Confucius is buried. You know, Confucius say this. That's where he's buried. He died, started Confucianism, uh, major world religion. That's where he is. Let's look at another one. Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon church. Again, guy went out in a blaze of glory. All his gunshots and all that. After the gunshots, that's where they brought him. Right there. Next one. Islam. This is uh, where uh, Muhammad is buried. Father of Islam, that's where he is. That's where he's buried right now. You can't go in and see him. You can only see the door. He's the one on the left right there. So if you go, that's the one. But people travel from all over the world to see this door. Like, oh, that's where he's buried. That's where he's at. Let's look at this last one. I love this one. <laughs> you know what this is? This is, uh, this is one of many of the tombs for the Buddha. Right? Because they, they cremated the Buddha and they, they mixed him in with relics and different things and like spread them all out over the world. But guess what? These guys were lucky and they got his tooth. So uh, this is the temple of the tooth. So uh, that's where it is. That's where Buddha's tooth is right there. Guess what? We don't have a tomb that we can go to. There, there's a couple tombs that they say, oh, this is probably the one that he was from. But guess what? All the ones that they found, they're empty. There's no one in there. They don't even bother looking for one that has someone in there because they know he rose again. He rose from the dead. Acts says that over 500 people saw him after he rose from the dead. Over 500 people were eyewitnesses saying, wow, I saw him before. I saw him die. And yep, there he is now. Over 500 people. And all of, many of those people and all of of Jesus' disciples, except one, except John, all of them died for this belief. And we say, oh, they died for their faith. 
But I challenge that they didn't really die just for faith alone. They died for something that they saw. They died because they said that we saw a risen Jesus. They died because they said, we saw him die and we saw him come back to life again. And I'm sorry that you don't like that, but I can't deny what I actually saw. I mean, you think about it. If this was all a big lie, at some point, you think they say, oh, you're going to kill me? Um, you know what? It was just a joke. We stole the body. Here's the body. It was just a big hoax. We're sorry. No, they all died for what they, what they saw, not for what they believed. See, because all the world religions, they give us the D.O. They give us the things to do. The things to do to be made right with God. The things to do to be closer to God. The things to do to, to treat your, your friends and family and your neighbors properly. But what Jesus gives us is the D-O-N-E saying, it's done. It's done. There's nothing you can D-O to make it anymore. D-O-N-E. There's nothing you can do to make it done. There's nothing that you can do to make yourself right with God. Because it's already done by Jesus on the cross. He did it for you. And, and there's nothing that you can do. Man, the cross, it couldn't kill him. There's nothing that cross could do. It couldn't kill him. The tomb, it couldn't contain him. And those burial wrappings, they couldn't hold him. Because when he was going to come alive, he came alive and he is alive and gives us a hope for the future. Man, that's something to be excited about. Man, he is alive. We don't have to make pilgrimages to a tomb to see where our founder was laid because we have the same spirit with us even now. See, see, death on the cross did not make God's promises empty. Everyone thought it did. Everyone said, oh, he's dead, so all the promises are empty now. No, no, it didn't make his promise empty. Instead, the empty tomb made God's promise come alive. It brought, it brought these promises alive. Without the empty tomb, everything we have is empty promises. But we don't have a tomb with someone in it. We have a risen Lord. Because Jesus did what he said he would do, our lives can have hope and they can have meaning. We can be, as God's words, is a new creation. We can be a new person. Our old life is gone and, and, and he's going to give us a brand new start in life. The tomb was empty. But because of Jesus, it's filled with promise for us. And we serve a God that specializes in filling emptiness. I don't know if you've ever felt like your life is running empty before. Feel like you're just going, 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 but you just got nothing left there. Feel like, man, everything I'm doing is just meaningless. It's just emptiness, emptiness, emptiness. Maybe, maybe you're a success on the outside. People say, oh, wow, you're so successful. Wow, you're so smart. Wow, you get good grades, you always pass tests and you're like, but I just feel so empty inside. Listen to what it says in Romans 8, 11. This has become like one of my favorite verses. It says, the Spirit of God who did what? Who raised Jesus from the dead. Where does he live? He lives in you. The same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, he lives in the lives of each person that believe, that takes that step of faith to put their faith in Jesus Christ. He says, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. And just as God raised Jesus, Christ Jesus from the dead, he will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living within you. Man, that's exciting. It's exciting to say, you know, it doesn't matter what you've been through in your life. It doesn't matter what pain you've been through. It doesn't matter your addiction that you're facing right now. It doesn't matter the struggles, the strongholds, the relationships that are falling apart, the grades that are coming apart, you know, all these things that, that are coming apart in your life. It doesn't matter because it says the same power that rose Jesus from the dead is alive in you. And man, if he can conquer the grave, he can conquer whatever obstacle you're facing in your life. If you yield that to him, if you say, God, I'm going to choose to follow you from now on. I'm going to put my faith and trust in you. Because that same power is available to you even now. This resurrected king is now resurrecting me and you. He's saying, you once were dead, but now I'm going to bring you alive because I came to life again. Because of my resurrection, I can resurrect. He went and robbed the grave. He said, grave, you can't hold me anymore. I'm more powerful 
than that. And that same power is available to each of us. And God, he takes our emptiness and he fills it with promises. He fills it with promises of, of, of a new life. In John eleven twenty five, 25, Jesus told her, he says, I, I, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even after dying. He's not saying, I'm here to tell you about resurrection, guys. He's not saying, here's how resurrection works, folks. He's not saying, hey, guys, let me show you a little illustration of what resurrection is. Oh, let me tell you a parable about what resurrection is. He's saying, no, guys, look, look at me, look at me. Hey, Peter, John, come on over here, look at me, look at me. I am the resurrection and the life. They're like, what? <laughs> So I'm not, I, now see when he died that all didn't make sense anymore it's like oh, it's just an empty promise but he says I am the resurrection and the life this is, this is I am this is not the D-O this is not what you have to do to be resurrected this is not what you have to do to have a new life he's saying it's already D-O-N-E it's already done you want a new life you come to me because I am the resurrection and the life and anyone who believes where? Not believes in my teachings, not believes in my miracles, not believes in my, 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 my parables, not believes that the world was created in a literal six days, not believing in any of those things. He says, he who believes in me will live even after dying. Man, that's a promise that's full. That's full of life. But we only get that full promise because of the empty tomb that we had. Man, he's now in me, that same spirit, that same power. And we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. But you know what? He's saying, guys, I want to resurrect you also. I want to bring you to life as well. And this is why I challenge you wherever you are in your in your spiritual journey. Maybe you've come here and maybe you've been seeking you're exploring what faith means, or maybe you, you just came because someone drug you here. Maybe you've just been coming a long time, and, and maybe you already do believe. That's, that's great, too. But I would, I would encourage you that on this Easter Sunday that you put your faith in, in Jesus Christ. Not because of what he said, but because of what he did. Some of you may say, well, well I, I've been to church before, and church always burned me, and the pastors are, are, are is a jerk, and you know, uh, I, and Christians, man, I work with some Christians. You can't trust them further than you can throw them, you know. And oh man, I grew up with this and that, and and I just I, I can't believe because of that. No, 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 no. Let's put all that aside for a second, because that's not what we have to believe in to have faith in God. Jesus is saying, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live will live. Yeah, maybe there's people that, that you've got a bad experience from saying, you will live. Base it on me, not on that. Base it on me. Because he left an empty tomb and he left an empty cross. No one else did that. No one else paid the price for your sin. Let's close in prayer. Father, we come to you. We thank you for leaving us an empty cross and an empty tomb. And it made all the difference in the world. There's no other, no other person that could have pulled this off but you. And we thank you that your word says that the same power that rose Jesus from the grave, well, it didn't just go away that day, but that same power is alive and it's here for us through your Holy Spirit and that it, 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 it can free us from the bondages of, of sin and addiction and bondage and, and things that have held us back for so long and we just ask you for your spirit to fill us now. And wherever you are in your faith if I would challenge you to take the step to put your faith and trust in Jesus. Not because of what he said, not because he told good stories, not because he was a good prophet, 
but because he died for your sin and came back to life again. Scripture says that if you believe that and you say that, you're saved. And for the rest of us that maybe already believe that, let's, let's take this day, let's, let's recommit our lives to Jesus right now. And let's pray together. It's not a magic thing. It's just simply stating what we believe. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you that Jesus, although he died, he's alive. And that same power is available to me. And I'm sorry for my sin. And I'm going to follow you. You are my Lord. Father, take our hearts. Take us, move us, make us, shape us and transform us into what you want us to be. B bring us back to life again. You resurrected Jesus. And now we ask you to resurrect our lives as well. And it's in his name that we pray. And we all said...